Hello, welcome everyone. So uh, as Heather was saying, uh, I am Irving Puerta. I am part of CDH at Cambridge University. And uh, I'm just going to be sharing today's session to, to present some of the, the results from the data lab that we had um, last week as part of this reactor program uh, from CDH. So um, today uh, we're going to do that exactly. We're going to present some of the results, uh, information that we think is relevant. Right? and also have some responses from, from some panelists that we've invited uh, as a reaction to this. So um, before I start, I just wanted to, to read very briefly something, something, something Ali Abdel Fattah uh, wrote in 2011. He, this was just after he, 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 he met his, his son for the first time. My God, how come he's so beautiful? Love at first touch. In half an hour, he gave me joy enough to fill the prison for a week. In half an hour, I gave him love I hoped would surround him for a week. In half an hour, I changed and the universe changed around me. Now I understand why I'm in the prison. They want to deprive me of joy. Now I understand why I resist. I will resist. Prison will not stop my love. My happiness is resistance. Holding Colette his son, is continuing the struggle. I'm never alone in my resistance. There are always people in solidarity. So in that spirit of solidarity, today we uh, would like to start by saying that we had invited uh, Ali Abd El Fattah uh, to, to, to join us for, for, for the data lab as part of this reactor exercise. Uh, for those who, who are not familiar with, with, with the case with him, uh, Ale is a software developer, journalist, and author. He pioneered online and citizen journalism in Egypt during the decade before the revolution of 2011. Uh, he co-founded influential, the influential blog aggregators um, Manala and Omranea, Om using his personal blog and Twitter account to build a substantial audience both inside and outside Egypt. Uh, during 2011, he emerged as a leading figure opposing military rule and advocating for human rights, democracy, and freedom of expression. He has been imprisoned repeatedly and has spent most of the past decade behind bars in brutal conditions. He is an amnesty prisoner of conscience and a British citizen. Ali is currently in prison following a trial in December 2021, which sentenced him to five years in prison for publishing a tweet about torture. And as I said, we had invited Ali to, to join us because we, we recognize that his uh, expertise that also his understanding of the situation of Egypt at large would have uh, benefited uh, the data lab, but uh, he, he did not join us because he is in prison. So uh, we, we, we are um, mentioning his name um, uh, as someone who could have um, uh, sort of provided lots of input for us. And we are conducting this, this event also uh, in solidarity, as he was saying. Now, just uh, for, for a structure very quickly um, uh, and, ho and housekeeping, right? Just to know what we're going to do today. This, this session today is going to consist of two parts. The first part is going to be the presentation of the data lab, uh, this data lab that took place a week ago and which was an exercise to explore uh, data uh, about the, the role of Egypt and uh, uh, some environmental initiatives as well, obviously in the context of COP27 taking place. Um, so that, that took place, uh, uh, that data lab a week ago, and we're going to present what we did over there. A group of researchers from Cambridge, from Cambridge conducted it, and we're going to present the results as well of, of that data lab. And later on in the second part, we're going to have a response or a reaction in this reactor from uh, a few panelists that we have invited. So we, we, we have invited um, Omar Robert Hamilton, who is a filmmaker, filmmaker and a writer, Miriam uh, Ora, who is a reader and, uh, uh, at the Communication and Media Research Institute at the University of Westminster, and Hamza Hamushen, who is a London-based Algerian researcher and activist. Right. Um, also, um, 
as a, uh, as, a, as, a, as a note for housekeeping, we're going to we're recording this uh, this session. Um, we're recording the whole of this session, um, but we're going to be careful uh, not not to mention the names in case people don't want to uh, don't want to be named. They have a questions and uh, and they can put it on the on the chat and they don't want to be named. So you can you, you so you can feel free to 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 put your questions in the chat. And uh, we won't mention the name. All the panelists, of course, will be recorded, and the whole session will be uh, recorded, as I just said. So um, I would like to to hand over to to Anne and Alexander, who is director of learning. She is going to also uh, today present the, the project of the reactor, the data lab, and present along with uh, other researchers at Cambridge. Uh, what they did uh, in the past week. So, Anne, over to you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Irving, for the introduction. Uh, and also thank you very much to our participants um, in the Data Lab and to our panellists. Um, I particularly want to thank um, Omar for coming and joining us in um, very, very difficult circumstances, or very painful circumstances, to take the time to come and join this event. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, so I just want to explain about the data lab and I will share my screen um, presentation. So the data lab is a new format that we have been working with at um, Cambridge Digital Humanities. And as I've been explained, it is a a response and a reaction to events that are happening in the world. We decided that we would want, we wanted to explore uh, what was going on at COP27, um, but in a practical focused way. Um, so we ran a participatory workshop, um, which focused on using digital methods and data journalism to explore uh, themes around climate justice, um, around the role of, uh, of data investigations and potentially uh, exposing um, uh, information about energy policy, energy trans uh, transformation, uh, and about the policies of the Egyptian government and other governments uh, in the region. Um, and we invited, we put out a call for uh, early career researchers at the University of Cambridge to join us. Um, and we invited the, uh, those who responded to come and, uh, and take part. Um, we invited our, our guest contributors as well, based on their expert knowledge of the, of, of the region. And as I've been said, um, we really felt that Alain uh, uh, Abdelfassas' um, expertise, both as a software developer, um, as a journalist, as an activist, uh, would have really added to this event. And that his, the invitation to him uh, is a recognition of that, but also it's a recognition that he, like so many others in Egypt, is unable to do that kind of vital work that's vital for uh, democratic participation in any society. Um, the Data Lab was a short workshop. Uh, we also have done work after the Data Lab itself, which it took place on the 7th of, uh, of, of November. Um, we, um, we moved, uh, we then moved online for some of our further, in, further investigations. They, data labs don't, they're not expected to produce polished or finished outcomes necessarily in a short space of time. And I'll come back to some of the actual uh, results, if you like, in terms of the, the, the outputs that we've made from this, from, from this work. But essentially they're incubators, incubators of new ideas, of lines of inquiry, and incubators of collaborations. Um, the participants in the lab included the following, following people, myself, um, Bruno schmidt Feuerhert. Mohammed and Naim, Sophia, uh, Sophia Stavanovic, Joycelyn Longdon, and Liz uh, Eileen Yan. Um, uh, Mohammed, Sophia, Joycelyn, and Eileen uh, are speaking were with me in this presentation. We also benefited from um, support from uh, and advice uh, on data investigations from Irving Heiter and Hugo Leo, who's also, I think, in the audience. Um, and there were other participants as, uh, uh, as well in the, in the data lab. Um, I've mentioned already, and uh, Irving is going to introduce our, our contributors um, uh, when they come uh, to speak later. And we've, of course, mentioned um, Alain's work. So I want to move on now um, to introduce the first part of the work that we did, 
which was to look at uh, Egypt's energy transformation um, over the last few years. This was focused on seeing what we could discover using you know, relatively simple tools, um, search engines to look for publicly available information from media sources, news reports, uh, Facebook pages of um, government institutions such as the uh, Egyptian Ministry of, of Petroleum Resources uh, in both English and Arabic, um, and to, to look for maps, um, data and, and information to help us build up a picture and also to, to clean and curate and, uh, and, and create data sets that we hope that we'll be able to publish in the next uh, short, in the next few weeks uh, in order to help other people carry on these kind of investigations. So what's the context for this? Well, um, the scientific consensus is very clear about the urgent need to dramatically reduce emissions from, uh, from fossil fuels, such as oil, coal, oil, and gas, in order to slow down global heating. Uh, targets have been set for the reduction in emissions by the, uh, under the terms of the Paris Agreement, which uh, essentially maps out a process by which the, it is supposed to be possible to keep, uh, have a chance of keeping global heating below uh, 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and the COP process has involved recently negotiations on how to achieve decarbonisation in key, in key sectors, um, such as power, road transport, steel, um, hydrogen, hydrogen and agricultural sectors. Um, if we are going to make any progress towards this, it will require the transformation in particular of energy, energy production. Um, so one of the areas that we looked at was the transformation in Egypt's energy infrastructure. We looked at how it's changed since in the years since CCC's power in the military coup in July 2013. And we made a very an exploratory analysis. This was a probe, it's not a comprehensive study, because that's not possible in the amount of time and resources we had available. But we looked at three main areas uh, of investment and activity. Uh, we looked at hydrogen and ammonia, at solar and wind, and at fossil fuel production, in particular fossil fuel exploration. Uh, in the areas of crude oil production and gas. All of these areas have seen substantial growth in foreign direct investment since, 20, since 2014. I'm now going to um, pass over to um, uh, Jocelyn, who's going to talk us through the um, uh, expansion in hydrogen uh, and ammonia production. Hi, thanks, Anne. Um, yeah, so just um, kind of following on from uh, Anne's description of the importance of the energy transition, um, the breakthrough agenda was an agenda that was um, created last year at COP26, um, and it basically provided a framework for countries, businesses, civil society to strengthen their actions every year in relation to energy transition. And this agenda was revisited um, at COP27, and it's really important because it's endorsed by 45 of the world leaders who collectively represent around 70% of global GDP. Um, and the result of uh, these negotiations around the breakthrough agenda um, was a package of 28 kind of priority actions that were um, associated with um, transitions in power, road, um, transport, steel, hydrogen, um, and other energy intensive sectors. Um, and concerning hydrogen specifically, the main objective is to make affordable, um, low carbon uh, hydrogen globally available by 2030. Could go to the next slide, please. Um, but one of the priorities that I'd like to hone in on is this um, priority number four for the hydrogen um, document, which looks to um, which looks at finance and investment um, and pushes for an enhancement of the overall public offering of international assistance for clean hydrogen projects um, by coordinating and facilitating access to increased concessional finance and related support. Um, with the goal of mobilizing private investment specifically at scale. Um, in emerging and developing economies. And this is really important in the context of Egypt, especially in the wake of COP27, um, because of the following slide. 
in the lead up to COP27, unlike um, other more uh, traditional energy methods, hydrogen has been getting a lot of hype, um, specifically in relation to Egypt. Egypt is being seen as this sort of green hydrogen hotspot or green hydrogen powerhouse. Um, and there was a sort of cycle of investment influencing hype, influencing more investment, influencing hype. And unlike some of the other traditional energy um, sources, this isn't already established in Egypt. Egypt is actually one of um, Africa's biggest um, hydrogen consumers, but not, not really has not really developed in its infrastructure for hydrogen um, production. And so this can be seen as a motivation for so much investment. Um, yeah, uh, can I go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so in total, um, it's estimated that around $100 billion of green hydrogen investment came in um, ahead of COP27 this year. That was a mixture of um, signed mem memorandums, um, all sort of um, pledged money that has not yet been signed on. Um, and what's really interesting here is about the rhetoric. Um, in, in the lead up to COP, the rhetoric has been that Egypt is developing as a green powerhouse. But when we dive a bit deeper into the information on the development, we see that a lot of these um, new infrastructure projects are not really going to benefit the Egyptian uh, public or, or support Egyptian local energy production. Um, an article from Recharge, a global news site covering the green transition, said, uh, reported on the government's assertions that um, they would not be uh, building or using any of these projects for, um, for, for local use or for domestic use. Um, and considering that, uh, considering the context of this, um, this is what I find quite interesting that almost all the projects that have been signed on to um, appear to have their eyes on shipping um, and on fueling shipping coming through the Suez Canal, which accounts for about 13% of global trade. And five out of the seven projects um, that will be developed will be developed in the port of Sopna in the Gulf of Suez, um, around 50 kilometers south of the canal's southern entry point, which is quite a burgeoning industry for um, oil refiners, chemical and petrochemical sites and fertilizer producers, which makes uh, the positioning of these sites um, really important for uh, non-green, uh, non-renewable energy resources. And this underlying agenda seems to come out um, with the kind of potential, huge potential for export to Europe. Um, so there's a target set already for um, an export of around 10 million tonnes of green hydrogen by 2030. Um, but this is going to be used for decarbonisation, mainly in Europe, not within um, Egypt. And uh, the point, the reason that that's important will come clear when we move on to the fossil fuel um, expansion, because um, if, if Egypt was actually dedicated to transitioning to green energy for itself, um, these projects should be replacing domestic fossil fuel use, but rather they'll be going forward to, um, to international um, decarbonisation. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, kind of last note based on um, this underlying um, agenda for export, it's just um, that in the context of COP27, in the context of the hype, if um, this transition is supposed to be a goal, um, then, but uh, more extractive practices are coming to play, we're seeing this sort of resource colonialism coming from the outside, influenced and motivated by financial um, reward for mainly state actors or private interest um, rather than community interest and green transition for Egypt as a whole. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jocelyn. Um, and so now uh, we're going to move to Sophia, who will tell us about the solar investments. Hi, can, can you hear me? 
Thanks, Anne, uh, and thanks, Jocelyn. Um, so this really is building on the points, many of the points that Jocelyn has already raised uh, around hydrogen. Um, I will focus on a specific um, project, in solar project in Egypt, rather than giving an overview of solar and wind in Egypt as a whole, which I'm definitely not qualified to talk about. Um, so I want to focus on the largest solar park that it, that is one of the largest in the world, actually, and the largest in Africa, uh, the Benban Solar Park, to say that the hype around green energy uh, is definitely not reserved uh, for hydrogen only. Uh, Egypt is home to one of the largest solar parks in the world, the Benban Solar Park, which consists of 41 uh, solar, uh, solar power plants and which has cost around $4 uh, billion in total. And the investments have come from different international companies. Uh, so I believe the project was, uh, most of it was developed and opened in 2019. And it's a reflection of a growing tr trend of investments uh, in both solar and wind. But also uh, this project is representative of the growing global phenomenon of what some scholars and activists and practitioner practitioners called green extractivism. Uh, and I'd like to develop a little bit on that point. Uh, so to first start with the hype, so I'm quoting the, the UN framework for climate change here, uh, which says that the Bemban Solar Park is the largest solar project in Africa and a template for what, what can be achieved in renewable energy. And they also say that this heralds a new renewable age. Uh, but as Jocelyn has already mentioned, um, when you start digging in deeper to see where this action, uh, where this energy is actually going and who benefits from this, uh, you quickly start realizing uh, that this is not necessarily something that like projects like these are not necessarily projects that benefit uh, Egyptian people. Um, so here I'm mixing, so here I'm not talking just about uh, solar energy, but drawing on recent examples of how the Egyptian government has prioritized uh, energy exports at the expense of Egyptian people. So recently, for example, uh, you had one of the articles covering um, electricity restrictions that were introduced to prioritize uh, exports of natural gas. Uh, so we already have these examples of sort of prioritizing um, export of energy over the, the, the needs of Egyptian people. Uh, and the risk really is that these large uh, renewable projects are perpetuating perpetuating the same sort of harms uh, that the fossil fuel infrastructure that, that's in place um, is known for, that we normally associate with the fossil fuel uh, infrastructure. So some of the extractivism can be more, di more direct, um, thinking about energy exports, but there are also more indirect forms of extractivism. And here I'm drawing on uh, an article from MADA uh, that is a, an Egyptian, an Egypt-based based, uh, media organization that talks about uh, how some of the companies that are part of the, the Ben Ben Solar Park are preparing to sell carbon certificates. Uh, so what does this mean? They're trying to get qualifications to be able to trade carbon uh, on the global carbon markets. So the energy that gets produced in the solar park, in the Benban Solar Park, could be used to uh, by large corporations to offset uh, some of their carbon uh, emissions, which we can see as a more indirect form of extractivism. Um, and as the article also points out, um, so maybe first I will mention just some of the issues with carbon trading in general, and there's uh, quite a lot of literature on this at this point. Uh, some of the issues are that it can lead to double counting of emissions reductions, for example, uh, but also most currently available offsets uh, do not reliably lead to reductions uh, in emissions, which is obviously a big problem. Uh, and as the article in Mata also points out, there are concerns over what gets counted as climate finance as well. And for those of you who have been following the COP, you'll know that there's a lot of talk of loss and damage and also climate finance in general and sort of and reparations as well and sort of what the countries that have been polluting uh, most throughout history uh, owe to the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. And to quote uh, an environmental, independent environmental researcher, Amna Sharaf, um, she says, if Egypt settles allowing carbon certificate purchases to count as climate financing, this would mean prioritizing meager profits in the short run instead of forcing polluting companies and countries to pay larger compensations in the long run. So there's a risk that uh, 
that for um, sort of profit driven reasons and for the and to establish a benefit for uh, private corporations, these renewable energy projects don't actually end up benefiting the country as a whole. Um, and this this experience, Egypt's experience with solar, is part of a global trend of problematic expansion of renewables or so-called green technologies for the benefit of local elites, wealthy countries and corporations, and at the expense of local communities. Uh, whether it's in Oaxaca in Mexico, where indigenous communities have resisted actually displacement by large scale wind farms that are producing electricity uh, for elsewhere, uh, or the border territories in Myanmar, where most of the rare earth minerals that are used uh, in renewable technologies are being mined um, under in min military controlled territories uh, and under brutal military repression. Uh, we're seeing how these new energy infrastructures can actually perpetuate the harmful practices of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, of course, we should be moving away from fossil fuels. And this is a question that often comes up um, when people criticize uh, large renewable projects. And of course, we should be moving away from fossil fuels, but we should also acknowledge that not all renewables projects are made equal. And I will suggest a non-exhaustive list of questions we could ask when we are presented with so-called climate solutions, um, especially when they relate to so-called green technologies. Uh, so we could be asking who stands to benefit from these projects and who loses. Uh, is it displacing people or poisoning their lands, water, or air? And finally, is it continuing the same cycles of neo-colonial violence that caused the climate crisis in the first place? And I will hand over to Liz, I think. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sophia. Actually, I'm taking up the story for uh, another few slides. So we've heard about how there has been a huge rush of investment into hydrogen and um, a lot of promises in that area. There's also been a massive amount of investment in the expansion of some forms of renewable energy, such as solar. Um, but actually, one of the points that we uh, have, you know, illustrated from the work we've done at the data at the data lab is that there has also been an enormous expansion in fossil fuel exploration and production over the last eight years. Um, so one of the areas that we have concentrated on in gathering gathering data um, and putting it into a form that it can be easily visualised is around, for example, the number of exploration agreements signed with global companies um, for petroleum and gas. Uh, according to the Egyptian Ministry of Petroleum, the number of number of new agreements in the last, since 2014 uh, in Egypt has been 108, and the total minimum investment uh, around $22 billion, with an additional signing um uh, a, a, an additional 1.3 billion dollars of um of signing bonuses that's actually 401 new oil and gas exploration projects uh of which 281 are in crude oil and 120 in gas um this has led to the discovery of 503 million barrels of petroleum reserves and new gas reserves of 39.9 trillion cubic feet one of the uh, data sets that we've worked on um, has been to uh, create a small data set of uh, some of the information related to this new oil and gas exploration based on the data that has been published on in news, uh, news reports of uh, the bid rounds that the Egyptian state entities such as the um, uh, uh, it's affiliated with the Ministry of Petroleum have made bids, uh, made uh, tender rounds for concessions in areas such as the Western Desert, Mediterranean, uh, the Nile Delta, and so on. This is a snapshot of some of the data. Um, I'm going to hand back actually to Sophia for to talk us through the next slide um, because uh, she has helped create uh, an interactive map of some of this exploration activity. Okay, just uh, a few quick comments, and if you can just play the uh, the video. Uh, so the map that we currently have shows the new oil and gas exploration from 2013 uh, until around 2018. So there are more to be added between 2018 and, uh, and today. Uh, but essentially what we have right now are rough locations. For some of them, it was really difficult to find exactly where the locations were. So 
Um, we just placed them roughly uh, in the correct area, and we're still working on uh, locating all of them, finding right places. And I should just note that currently the size of the bubbles represent um, it is proportional to the number of wells, so exploratory wells that uh, that concessions were granted for, that licenses were, licenses were given out for. Uh, but actually, often these areas are really huge, uh, and that's not reflected in the size of the bubble. So it could be really hundreds uh, of kilometers squared that are covered, um, that are given out um, for uh, exploratory drilling. Uh, so we're still working on uh, developing this map further, but you can currently see where the licenses are and how many wells roughly in different are in different areas. Um, thanks very much, Sophia. And um, as I said, we're hoping in the next few weeks we'll be able to publish the, the data and the code for this, uh, for this map. Um, so why is this important? Well, because exploration uh, leads to discovery. And one of the key discoveries that has taken place in the Egyptian, uh, in the Egyptian territory uh, in the last in the last during that period was uh, the discovery of the Zohar gas field in the Mediterranean, an offshore gas field. It was discovered in 2015 as a result precisely of one of these uh, exploratory uh, concession uh, that were made uh, in the Sharuk Shur offshore concession. Uh, has estimated reserves of 30 trillion cubic feet of gas, it's the largest gas field in the eastern Mediterranean, the current stakeholders, the Mobadila Energy, which is based in UAE, uh, global um, uh, uh, company BP, Rosneft, and, e and the Italian state energy company ENI. Production began in 2017. Why is this significant? Because the scale of this kind of discovery, I think, could be uh, very easily considered uh, a carbon bomb. This terminology has been developed by researchers, uh, climate researchers and also used in the climate justice movement um, to identify very, very large, um, uh, very, very large projects that have a potential of over a gigaton of carbon, of carbon dioxide potential emissions over, over, coming, over coming years. Um, for example, uh, Kuna and, uh, and colleagues mapped 425 of these projects globally. Um, and this is the, the, the spending of the, of the carbon budget from these by burning any of the fuel in these, uh, these so-called carbon bombs. Uh, if, they were all, if they were all detonated, um, this would mean ex exceeding the, 1 .5, the budget for the 1.5 1, 1 degree uh, rise in, uh, in global temperatures by a factor of two. Um, the Zohar field is not listed in this particular, uh, in this particular uh, uh, listing of, of carbon bombs, but it, I noted, it, we noted that the Israeli owned the Biafin uh, field, which is next to Zohar, is, um, and actually Zohar has much larger reserves than the Biafins. This is not just an important, this is not just something that has an impact um, therefore on Egypt. And we'll hear a bit later from Mohammed about the, uh, how Egypt is in Ocean Care, which is a marine, marine conservation charity. It says the, the Mediterranean basin is a hotspot for climate cha change. Offshore oil and gas exploration license is now issued under the pretext of the energy crisis caused by the war in Ukraine would lead to production only in more than five years from now, and just thus an abuse of the situation. Every cent invested now in oil and gas exploration is wasted and will be missing in crisis management and energy transition uh, efforts uh, for people and for, for wildlife, for biodiversity in, uh, across the whole swathe of, uh, uh, of the Mediterranean and beyond. I'm now going to hand over to Liz, who's going to talk us through a connection then between this expansion of, uh, of fossil fuel um, production and exploration and the COP process itself. Hi, so I'm going to talk a bit about the presence of climate lobby, um, fossil fuel lobbyists and what that means for COP and particularly like the Middle East. So, so a recently published report by Global Witness Council, there are in total 636 fossil fuel lobbyists currently at COP. Um, they define it as anyone who's either directly affiliated with corporate corporations such as Shell, Chevron, BP, or attending as a part of a national delegation to represent the industry. Um, compared to COP26 last year, 
we've seen a 25% hike. So due to the sheer number of increase in lobbyists, third party watchers such as corporate accountability have commented that the COP27 looks like a fossil fuel industry trade show than a climate negotiation. And the increase of lobbyist presence at COP, um, especially take, well, the, is taking place in Sharm El Sheikh conference hall flanked by luxury holiday resorts and a new shopping center is set against activists and protesters who are sectioned off into a purposeful area far out into the desert. Um, and the Guardian has reported increased surveillance, such as the Egyptian government com commissioned 500, ta 500 taxis equipped with cameras connected to local security observ observatories for monitoring, or or the fact that you have to enable like location tracking on your phone to use the COP27 mobile app. Um, the juxtaposition of lobbyists against like people who are for climate policy um, just goes to show that fossil fuel industry is growing influence in climate negotiations, but also that the voices of voices who are against their influence and you know their web of interest um, with the authoritarian regime of Egypt are silenced. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here is a map that I kind of, that shows where where delegate where who like well where where these fossil fuel lobbyists are from in the na national delegation and we can see that the uae and russia top the charts but that's i think for me that's at least kind of expected but what was less what's more interesting is the fact that despite being the african cop there are more fossil fuel lobbyists registered in any national delegation from the african continent so out of the 29 countries that have fossil fuel lobbyists within their delegations from the map here, we can see that um, Kenya, Congo, Angola, and Namibia are pre are there, and they're one of the, they send the biggest delegation. Well, the, they send most lobbyists within their delegation, um, and this is an interesting development since last year, especially under the condition that African habitats stand out disproportionately um, as the most vulnerable region in the world to climate change. But at the same time, you know, they're more vulnerable, but we're seeing more fossil fuel lobbyists um, there. So we see news coming out of COP27 with African lobbyists, such as the head of the African Petroleum Producers Organization, um, who's from Nigeria, pushing to exploit the reserves, arguing for the development of fossil fuel in Africa, um, citing that millions of people across the continent do not have access to electricity. Um, he also rejects the idea to forego African reserves in exchange for renewable tech and funding from richer countries. Um, and in his view, and I quote, if you're not at the table, you'll be on a menu, which I interpret as if you're not self-subsistence self in terms of energy, the resources you have will be exploited. And this is, I think, exactly what we're seeing in Egypt. Um, lobbyists have also been hard at work promoting carbon capture as a solution when actually the technology is not quite there yet and it's a band-aid solution to a huge problem. Um, so overall, to sum up, oil and gas corporate influence is increasing. And from the trend just described, we may be able to infer that there is a tension, especially for African nations to grow economically, but also sustainably without relying on richer countries to help them, um, since funding pledges from the West have not been realized. Um, they could be internally divided in their decision makers representing the country who are negotiating at the COP may not really reflect the views or interest of their people. Um, and states such as Egypt and Nigeria, two cases that I mentioned, certainly are not um, the best examples of putting the interests of the people first. And I will leave this point to Mohammed for further elaboration. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Mohammed, who's going to take us through um, what this means in the context of uh, the, uh, the politics of the situation. Thanks, mm. Mohammed. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that Egypt has been doing is it's been pushing itself as kind of being at the forefront of fighting for climate reparations, using the language of loss and damage um, for the global south. And part of this has been um, 
uh, has been a way to position Egypt as being at the forefront of a kind of new green third world politics. But the reality of the matter is, is that uh, it, it forces us to ask deeper questions about who uh, climate reparations should be for um, and, and who's the one to benefit from it. There have been uh, a huge break. There has been a huge breakthrough in, in the COP27 discussions. Uh, for the first time, it seems that the Global North countries are at least open to a conversation on loss and damage, but they don't want to take any um, responsibility for the fact that the Global North is by far the highest uh, carbon um, emitter and, and, and pays the least. Uh, next slide, please. But uh, the reality also of the matter is, is that Egypt is already today in enduring what many of the global north countries are worried about as in the, within their future. It's close to two degrees centigrade hotter than, than, it, than it was in 1900. And even though it only um, contributes to 0.6% of global greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the summers are getting a lot hotter, exceeding 40 degrees Celsius. It's the fourth most uh, flood prone nation in the world. It's very vulnerable to flooding and salinization. But I think one of the biggest, biggest issues is, is that the vast majority of the population lives along, or along the banks of the Nile Delta, um, a, a huge amount of which will be submerged, um, even in the most conservative uh, estimates within the next 100 years. Next slide, please. And you can see that data here, um, for instance, uh, and this is uh, comparing uh, 1.5 degrees scenario, which still sees areas like um, Port Said and Alexandria almost entirely submerged, huge, huge amounts of it, but also uh, under a three degree Celsius scenario, uh, it gets much worse. Um, and that means that there is pressure for th this leads, this means that the resource conflicts have already begun. It means that there's going to be pressure for people to move into the interior and that there needs to be uh, preparations in place for this. The question then is, can that happen under an authoritarian regime? Um, next slide, please. This is again, just uh, reinforcing that point. Um, next slide. Um, and then the question in it also is, is as we've already seen, uh, hydrogen power, solar power, et cetera, um, Egypt positions itself as being as, uh, at the forefront of a transition into renewable energy. But um, it, may, it might be too early to tell. Uh, nonetheless, oil consumption and oil production uh, and gas production and gas consumption are still going on an upward trend. Um, and that is also not only because of the uh, domestic uh, needs for energy consumption increasing over time, but also because Egypt is trying to position itself as a net exporter of natural gas since the, um, the you know, discovery of vast amounts of gas oil fields. Next slide, please. But here's an interesting thing. Just as, for example, we had a conversation earlier about how Egypt tries to move, uh, tries to resolve, not just Egypt, but I think the whole world tries to resolve the energy crisis by moving it around. For example, selling carbon certificates to the global north, where on paper, okay, we're below our emissions rates, but they've just been pushed somewhere else. Or for example, um, th there's, there's ways in which this kind of trying to solve a problem by moving it around also happens in Egypt. I found this story really remarkable. Because Egypt is going through, uh, a debt crisis um, and a foreign sea reserve crisis. In order to retain its foreign, foreign currency reserves and to export natural gas, it's, it, there was a deal made between the Ministry of Electricity and the Ministry of Petroleum to make sure that instead of using natural gas, which is you know, the so-called transition fuel, they would use diesel to power electricity so that they could export natural gas. And so um, it's very important to note that Egypt in its national contributions to the Paris Agreement said that it was going to clean up its electricity and its, uh, and its other, uh, and transition to natural gas. But here it's dirtying its electricity in order to export natural gas in order to be able to resolve, uh, to be able to get more credit. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, and most importantly, another way in which the climate problem is moved around is maybe, let's say, um, let's say we were being generous and that we believe that natural gas is a transitionary fuel to uh, fossil fuel, fossil free, fossil fuel free future. Um, there have also been increases in the uh, cement uh, because of the construction boom and the boom in real estate. And as we know, the real estate industry more globally amounts to about 40% of emissions. 
Um, and this has also required a conversion of some power plants into coal. And this is a, an analysis based by the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights. And they think that uh, if things continue in this way and, there's, and the cement industry isn't reined in, then there'll be a 15% increase in carbon gases by 2030. So trying to resolve on one side uh, a renewable uh, energy problem on one side and, and causing an issue on the other is kind of the modus operandi here, um, but it doesn't seem to be working. Um, and next slide, please. And, you know, Egypt itself in its official uh, national contributions, which is kind of like a report that you give to the, pa the Paris Agreement, uh, admitted that the, their ambition on allocating future climate investments is limited because of how much debt is being taken up. But the question is, uh, and this is I bring up in the next slide, is where, where does the debt come from? Um, and that it doesn't come from any, from nowhere. Um, next slide. Uh, in an analysis by uh, Dr. Yazid Saeed, uh, he, he uh, analyzed that he's been noticing that the expansion of the, um, uh, of, of the military in, in the economy and particularly how it's been able to feed this. Since the coup, since Sisi's regime in 2014, there have been you know, increased amount of total government spending from the, on the side of the military and the military's um, um, companies uh, and public infrastructure and housing projects, but also in uh, profitable industries, including cement. Um, next slide. Uh, for, so, for example, uh, there's been a surge uh, of about um, uh, in debt, which um, uh, since the Sufi, since Sisi's regime and the Egyptian banks uh, have been borrowing um, so much that it's amounted to about 40 percent of the government's budget. And this map just kind of demonstrates all of the different kinds of um, investments that the military has in cement, in farms, in fisheries in airports, in defense industries. And so then, you know, the obvious question, uh, next slide, please, is if, if you have, if the military has investments in all of these, the next question is, uh, does that, is that in any way contributing to the climate crisis uh, that Egypt uh, and the whole world faces? And then the, the, the answer to that question is, is you can't, answer, you can't ask that question. Uh, nobody can, unless you want to find yourself in a prison. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is kind of one of the things that activists have been complaining about. They've said that Egypt's vast and opaque military business activity in quarrying, in water bottling plants, in cement factories are seen as sensitive. They're seen as natural infrastructure. And so the, the way in, especially in any kinds of questions on the new administrative capital, which is uh, what one activist told Human Rights Watch, a red line. Um, and, and I really wanna thank Sophia because uh, we had a conversation about militaries in general and militaries, more globally have have uh, under the guise of um, you know classified information under the guise of national security have been able to hide their carbon footprint uh, from the Paris climate agreement and and in Egypt is no different um, next slide please and then another issue is is that um, the, Increasingly, the attacks against environmentalists are, are not just attacks against them, they're attacks against all activists. And they, they use the same rationale. Um, you, you know, regular visits by the authorities to see if, if what you're doing goes against the national interest, looking into the funding of your organization to see if you're you know, ruining the reputation of Egypt globally. And then uh, just lots of paperwork and red tape to stop you from getting anything done. Um, it's the same thing that activists face and it's the same thing that climate scientists and climate activists in general face. Um, next slide. Um, and, you know, just again, another look, I wanted to, to just get a visualization of how much influence, especially since 2014, the Egyptian military has had over the economy. It has its stakes in steel, it has its stakes in uh, food, it has its stakes in a plastic factory, in the mining sector, in, um, in, in tourism. Uh, and I can assure you that none of these uh, projects have to go through either informed and prior consent by the communities that they potentially displace, nor do they, nor, nor are these companies audited, nor do they have to uh, face environmental assessments. Because, and if they do have to do their environmental assessments, the military will read those environmental assessments. Just as if they're gonna get audited, they're gonna get audited by themselves. Um, next slide. And so this, then this, this brings up the, the broader issue. Um, how is it possible 
right? Um, for us to ensure, for example, that loss and damages and climate reparations in the best situation will go to the people who are most affected. Um, how can, and, and the, the relationship between uh, regular human rights, right to expression and the right to civic space and, and environmental rights is not then therefore in the abstract, it's, it, they're intimately tied. There is no way in which we were, in which civil society is going to act as a watchdog against the Egyptian government uh, under these conditions. There's no way for us to know, uh, to, to, to have uh, transparent information. And um, there are certain no-go zones, especially in places like uh, Sina and, and other um, places deemed as like uh, national security interests, uh, where you're not even allowed to take a photograph. How are you gonna have an assessment of the climate impact there? Um, and so that I think uh, is, is pretty much a conclusion to, to what we, uh, one way to think about, about the situation. And I'll pass it on now to Dr. Aaron. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Mohammed. And so just to recap on the outcomes of the data lab, and we'll hand over to our guest panelists and I'll hand back to Irving. So we've created this presentation and researched this presentation, and we will be putting up a version of this on our website. We've created an interactive map of fossil fuel exploration activity in Egypt since 2013, and hopefully we'll be publishing the associated data and code in the next few weeks. Uh, we've also been working on a broader energy infrastructure transformation data set, which has selected case studies also on hydrogen and ammonia production, renewable energy sources, and we've done some small scale visualizations from the global witness data set on fossil fuel lobby lobbyists at COP. Um, and we, if you want to get in touch with us about any potential collaboration or working with this, um, then you can either drop us an email, learning at cdh.canvac.uk, and I'll put that in the chat, uh, and look out for announcements on our website about these outcomes. So thanks again to everyone who contributed both to the data lab and to the, and to the presentation. And I'll hand back now to Irving. Yes. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for, for that presentation. And uh, just, just as I know precisely, right, the, the, the aim, the intention of, of, of coming up with these uh, outcomes, although they're not kind of finished uh, products, is kind of to instill uh, some sort of, uh, or to steer up a little bit the, the debates and, and offer uh, certain resources that then people who, who are able to investigate you know, some of these issues can do it can be either academics or journalists or the NGOs uh, because the context uh, right now in, in Egypt is, is one in which uh, investigation and uh, you, you know a watchdog role is, is kind of prevented as you know the, the case of, of Ali has proved. So I just uh, would like to kind of introduce now to the second part to, to, to our panelists for the responses to, to, to this presentation. So I'm just going to present um, the three of them, and uh, uh, each one of them are going to, to 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 have like six to seven minutes to to give a response. Omar Robert Hamilton is a filmmaker and writer. He co-founded the Palestine Festival of Literature and the Mosserine Media Collective in Cairo. He's the beat novel "The City Always Wins," which is set within the Egyptian Revolution. Was published in 2017. Living in Cairo in the years after the coup. He wrote often for independent Egyptian newspaper Mada Masur on energy, colonialism, democracy, and industrial development. Most recently, he was the lead editor on uh, You Have Not Yet Been Defeated, the selected works of Ali Abdel uh, Fattah, 2011 to, to, 20, to 2021. And he is also Alice Cousin. Um, next, we have also Dr. Miriam uh, Ora, who is reader at the Communication and Media Research Institute at the University of Westminster. She has studied the implications of the internet as it was first introduced in Palestine to understand in particular the, the significance of techno-social evolutions by analyzing how a new technology coincided with the outbreak of a mass uprising, which op appeared in the monograph Palestine Online. Miriam then theorizes how the contradictions of capitalism shape the modes and meanings of resistance in the era of revolution and digital transformation. And um, our third speaker is uh, Dr. Hamza Hamushen, who is a London-based Algerian researcher, activist, commentator, and a founding member of Algeria Solidarity Campaign, 
Environmental Justice North Africa and the North African Food Sovereignty Network. He's currently the North Africa Program Coordinator at the Transnational Institute. His work is focused on issues on extractivism, resources, land and food, sovereignty, as well as climate, environmental and energy justice in North Africa. Uh, he saw the, his writings have appeared in Africa as a Country, The Guardian, Middle East Eye, Counter Punch, and many others. So I would like to hand over now to Omar uh, for his response uh, of um, six to, to, to seven minutes, as I said, and after Omar, then we have Miriam and then Hamza. But now over to you, Omar. Okay. Thanks. I will try and generate six or seven minutes, but I might fall short and maybe I could do with a question or something. I don't know. I think it was really interesting listening to the presentations. I think Mohammed presentation um, really nailed uh, the scale of the reality of, of how things are in Egypt and the extent of the military's control of the country and its presence at the center of multiple economies and uh, really at the core of every decision that gets made. And, and I think we have to apply that lens when we look backwards um, at the previous presentations and think about solar or hydrogen or, or what the uh, trajectory of those industries mean. I mean, there are a couple of times where the presenters talked about whether things were being done for the good of the local populace or thinking about things in terms of extractivism. But I think we have to actually just consider, first of all, that nothing is done for the good of the local populace. I mean, there is not a single move that the army ever makes that is for the good of the local populace. And so there is no equation where, like, if we change the dynamics of foreign investment or applied kind of I don't know, certain extra sort of regulations to it, that it'd be possible to arrive at a position where the military was kind of producing cleaner energy somehow for the benefit of, of, of the local populace. Because, you know, I mean, that sounds extreme, but really it's like it, it's a regime that's entirely defined by corruption and short termism and violence and is ruled by, you know, people who are really trying to sort of get the maximum out of the country in what they imagine is probably not going to be very long, right? Like it's like everything is sort of being done in haste. Um, so, you know, I think we need to think then, um, when you think about, for example, solar, then the question isn't, for me, like it wouldn't be a problem if you're extracting in the sake, in, in the sake of like, or in the sense of, of solar power being generated in Egypt and then being sold in Europe or in Libya or in any other country because, well, first of all, you know, ultimately we're proposing that a borderless world is what we'd be looking for. And so I think if you have a resource like sunlight, then I think, great, let's share it around as quickly and as widely as we can. The question is who profits from that? Um, and whose power base does it entrench? And currently, of course, that is the Egyptian regime. Um, and that's sort of one of the tragedies almost of the renewable transition as it's sort of happening is on the one hand it feels like with things like solar power there is a lot of capacity for decentralizing power right small grids off grid micro grids community built installations like there's a lot of ways in which you could see that the sort of um the spread of quick and accessible solar technology widely could be very effective at um destabilizing a highly centralized power system but the egyptians are very aware of that and so they're also very very careful to not let that happen so the ben ban solar park is an interesting example like it's you know they tout it as the world's biggest solar park when it was built at the time or maybe it was i think the fourth now or something and it was built with a sort of collection of european finance institutions and and, and other and international banks um but it's very tightly controlled like and you can see from that map of egypt the defining feature of egypt is a sort of like it, it's one river and everything is built around the river and that really you know historically has been how it has how it well it's first of all how it sort of became the cradle of civilization and so on it was sort of this condensation of, of people and life and the possibility for civilization and now it kind of creates the conditions for control um so they built the ben ban solar park but for example, there's no real private solar um, industry in Egypt, even though, you know, as we've seen, the, the sunlight is abundant and the heat gets over 40 degrees centigrade and you could power the whole country very cheaply and uh, easily with solar power all through the year. But uh, the solar private industry is very, very restricted. It's, it's regulated very heavily, it's taxed very heavily. And there was a moment where it began to open up and then actually the government because it was so overcommitted to gas 
and had taken out massive loans at an undisclosed rate from a German bank, from four German banks to build Siemens power plants. But it now has, basically the Egyptian state can produce 50% more electricity than the country can consume at peak demand time. Um, so why did it build all this power? Why did it build this extra gas? Because energy power is a form of political power, right? Like this is a very obvious thing that we feel we're feeling in Europe right now. Russia's uh, turning off Nord Stream 1 and everyone is freaking out about the price of gas. And, you know, if a government can't keep the lights on through a winter, that government will fall. And um, so we all feel the connection between energy power and political power all over the world in our lives all the time. We're not always cognizant of it, but we know that it's there. And in Egypt, um, the Muslim Brotherhood in their one year in power basically managed the state finances so poorly that the the last few months were being defined by energy cuts, regular energy cuts. And that was one of the main drivers when the argument was being made to sort of take to the streets and call for early elections. That there was a sense that they were unable to manage the state at its most basic level, which is keeping the lights on. And especially a state like Egypt, where through years or decades of corruption, you don't really turn to the state for anything. You don't get security from it. You don't get healthcare from it. You don't get education from it. You don't get functioning roads from it. You don't even get functioning bridges from it. The trains crash routinely. You know, as a state, it doesn't offer you anything. And so the minimum, minimum, minimum that the state offers is keeping the electricity on. So CC spent big on making sure that the lights never go off. And he uh, took out a bunch of loans and he bought a load of favor with the German government. And suddenly Angela Merkel was sort of a semi fan of his. It was the biggest deal in the history of Siemens. And obviously Siemens is a very old company that has built a large part of the modern world. So it's made some big deals in its time, but this was the biggest ever in Siemens history. Um, and so, yeah, so basically they've kind of taken on a huge amount of debt to have an excess of energy, which means that they now restrict solar power um and so yeah all of that basically and um, the point being that that what you have is is this um is now solar hydrogen any other renewable because they've got smart to the potential of them they're also looking to control them very 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 carefully and tightly and to make sure that any steps in a kind of energy transition are taken carefully and slowly and in a way that benefits the regime centrally not in a way that can be spread around in a destabilizing way not in a way that spreads power of any kind to the populace or even truly advantage to the populace but is uh but is to be centrally controlled centrally administered centrally rolled out slowly um but also, yeah, always deprioritized because in the end, this is a petrol, petro state, you know, the only sector of the economy that hasn't shrunk consistently for the last four years is oil and gas. They've had this sort of strange blessing that they got the sort of the biggest gas field in the Eastern Mediterranean was discovered one year into or two years into CC's regime. And uh, they expect to find much more. Um, and of course, it's ultimately bankrolled by Saudi Arabia, the UAE. So, you know, there is no way Egypt from top to bottom is a petro state and a petro vassal state, which is another reason why any steps towards any kind of like energy transition, there are just, you know, they're also just surface play acting, right? And it's like, well, now we're hosting COP27, so we need to pretend like we're into this kind of thing. We need to stop talking about loss and damage. We need to pretend that we're going to be negotiating these. But here we are. I mean, COP27 is two days away, and everyone is saying it's been a complete disaster, which what we have all been saying, everyone in Egypt has been very clear in there that we would bet, you know, whatever, I bet several fingers that it was going to be a disaster and any kind of negotiation aims were not going to be... Um, realize because how can you actually negotiate when you are existentially defined and maintained um by the antithesis of an energy transition right like it's just there's a fundamental paradox there that the egyptians thought they could just sort of waltz through and the world thought well we can just sort of allow chalk that up as another one of the kind of hypocrisies or contradictions in the modern world but maybe it'll be somehow okay and it's going to be a disaster i mean it's two days away from ending and we're not going to have any kind of it's just going to be a year lost in terms of what cops could or couldn't potentially do um 
I think I've probably spoken for more than six minutes now, so I, I can I can stop or okay. I can carry on. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, sure. I think also the kind of the, the, the immediate context of COP twenty seven uh, was also kind of na nailed down there. Uh, so thank you, Omar. By the way, those who, who have questions, please uh, feel free to, to to put them in the chat right now. Later, I'm going to read them. So um, yeah, just uh, ask any questions in the chat, please. And then. Uh, in the meantime, while you put the questions there, I'm just going to, to, to ask Dr. Miriam Urak if she can also now give her response. Miriam? Miriam, are you there? Sorry, yes, just trying to get my... Oh, yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yes, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and also for letting me uh enjoy this meeting i'm learning so much i want to congratulate the research team this is really incredibly important work and this is meticulous you know how much the booming industry of internet research and ai and big data it's like left right center there's all these projects going on all this funding thrown at this uh, sometimes you really wonder what's it for what's it about but I, I think what you're doing is just really important i just wanted to um, to say that I, I just wanted to respond on, on some of the presentations more in terms of the general political um, uh, venue on a world stage that uh, the COP in Egypt uh, is now uh, showing us and all these different realities in the background around climate change. And I think that it's interesting because we've had similar experience in Morocco. And so I just wanted to, if that's okay, give you uh, an sort of uh, insight uh, in what happened that not that long ago um, in terms of um, the difference between the kind of like promises and, and demands and expectations and what happened in reality. And I just wanted to talk about COP22, uh, which was in, uh, in uh, Marrakesh in, in Morocco. And it is actually interesting because it's kind of the prelude to a lot of the greenwashing we we see now, uh, and particularly the 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 synchronicity between greenwashing and authoritarian regimes, and obviously this is not um, you know it's actually every day in the news if you read carefully the discussions about the tensions between ideals and realities are now also really. Um, in, in, in sort of everyday life uh, levels where because of uh, the World Cup. So you see also these feelings of contradictions where you have the World Cup in Qatar and then all these discussions about human rights and all the kind of like, you know, uh, problems around it. And so I think that there's a new level now also with um, the Egypt uh, COP, but that we have seen a previous stage of in Morocco. And I wanted to share with you where I think are three different assessments um, about what was then a historic first meeting because it was the first meeting in Morocco after the Paris Agreement. If you remember, the Paris Agreement was considered a historical uh, uh, meeting. And so I think the host Ideas from others about what's going on uh, in other countries, if that's the same. But I think one of the main reasons also of hosting it in Morocco was the ideological intention to change the rules of the game. And bizarrely, under sort of the guise of wanting to be inclusive, this is how inclusivity is also being used, uh, uh, as we know, very cynically in the Marrakesh climate talks was to actually allow uh, uh, fossil fuel uh, lobby groups a seat at the table, which was quite new in COP2022. Uh, so it was also, I think, hosted there because they wanted to change the rules of the game. So, so you had the inclusion of these groups that were indisputably driven by profit motives, and they were actually given official observer status. So they were there at the conference and they were having private and parallel meetings with different countries and different represent uh, rep uh, representations. And so they could, in some cases, uh, provide like separate funding 
uh, offers to countries and basically create divide and rule. Um, and it, it's quite incredible. I don't know if there's any ethnographic work written on that, but there were companies like Exxon Mobil, Chevron, BP, Shell. They were basically all walking around in the corridors uh, in Marrakesh and having these private uh, meetings. This was, I mean, met with a lot of criticism, but I think after COP22, it became also a new normal. So I think it's also important to, to pause and to ask, you know, like, is it just a stage? Is it all just fake? Are these meetings meaningless? And like some of the presentations have shown, and also uh, I also agree with Mohammed's take on some of the facts and figures, actually the promises that are made, they are not to be ridiculed. Uh, for a lot of people, particularly when it was hosted in Morocco, the promises for the from the Paris summit were really important. In a country that has you know, seen about 50% uh, of its uh, um, crop, crops devastated due to climate change, this sort of promise, uh, the pledge to reduce greenhouse emissions by 50% in 2015, 50 and 100% in, in by 2100 is not, you know, it's not unimportant. It's something to, to take serious. So, I mean, what was also very, very important in, in terms of the political background in 2016 during COP22 in Morocco, besides the greenwashing, that actually that was the year that Trump was also elected. And so the election of uh, Trump in a way ruined also the agenda of COP22, uh, uh, but that was not the only important assessments to be made of uh, COP22. The second, I think, assessment I wanted to share with you about COP22, which kind of relates to the discussions about Egypt now, is the observation about the extreme contradiction between having a, a liberal, progressive sounding uh, a conference in a very authoritarian place. Um, and I think this was really interesting in Morocco is because um, the uh, invitation of big NGOs to come to Morocco to join also during the talks was uh, uh, happening at a time when uh, there were major protests. I don't know if people remember, but in 2016, Morocco experienced in a way what was called the second wave of revolutions. That was the year. Like, I think it was two weeks before COP started that Mohsin Fikri was killed. And so this, and Mohsin Fikri was a Moroccan uh, uh, in the reef in Al Husayma, uh, whose death, the, the, the way he was killed and the sort of sense of Al Hogra that came with it is very much compared to uh, Bouazizi in Tunic, which led to the uprising. So the mass protest that erupted in Morocco. Uh, just one week before COP22 completely also changed the dynamics and the, and the, and the reporting of for COP22 was something that all the activists jumped on. And so this is also something that I wanted to also ask some of the other speakers, but also Omar, actually, this is something we feel now, right? Also in Egypt, where the kind of momentum is also grabbed by activists, if not desperately, then, then tactically to, to hope that at least the fact that all these cameras and all these news organizations that are descending to those cities where cops are hosted will maybe then shed some light on the human rights abuses. And this is what happened also uh, then in Morocco. It was a real dilemma for, for the government um, because it, it did the protests that erupted after the killing of Mohsin uh, Fikri uh, in uh, late October, uh, uh, just before the COP um, spread like wildfire. It catalyzed like this major, uh, sense of uprising. So, you know, like, um, interestingly enough, looking back, it really did cast a shadow on COP. And I just wonder, you know, like also what, what Anne and Omar think in terms of like whether the campaigns around the release of Allah Fattah and the human rights abuses in Egypt now also will have that uh, uh, effect. So that was the, that's the second assessment I wanted to share with you. So the first was it was we hosted there also with an ideological objective to change the rules of the game, to open the conference also to big business, to give them also official observer status. The second also how it coincides with political uh, uh, earthquakes and protest movements, which is what we saw in Morocco during COP. And that's why COP20 
too will never be forgotten in Morocco because it really will in the memory of people always be connected to the uprisings and, and the fact that it happened so soon after the killing of uh, Mohamed Fikri. And the third observation, if I have time, uh, that I wanted to share with you also about Morocco is that um, it was also the first opportunity, the COP, uh, which I think is not the same for Egypt because there's a longer history, but it was the first opportunity to really practice normalization with Israel. So you could use a kind of international climate uh, conference um, and say, well, it's not in our hands, it's international, it's the UN, it's not us, and then invite uh, uh, Israel uh, to be at the table. And this led to major protests as well. And that those protests of having uh, Israel officially at the table there, it was actually one of the first times. Now it happens so much more. The normalization has been normalized in, in a way. But it actually, at that time, it really was a sort of like introduction to what is going to be uh, to become um, a new normal with big conferences. Because authoritarian regimes can say, no, the, but this is the UN. It's beyond the nation state. And we have uh, no say. I don't know. There are some friends, I think, here also in the audience, I know some colleagues from Israel, I, I would like to know what they have to say about this, because uh, it's clearly one of the policies also of Hashbara to be part of those big conferences. Uh, so that's what that's my third observation of COP um, 22nd, that it was also a way to normalize the sort of presence of all these different countries. Uh, I have something else to say about online activism uh, and, and how that is useful or not at the moment, but I think I will leave it at this for now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, Miriam. I think we can go back to that one because I think you raised an important question for, for Anne and, 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 and Mohammed that we can go back to. But can we go uh, now to um, hand over to Hamza Hamushen, who, who um, now has his time to, to give his response? Hamza? Yes, I think we are we are over time, right? So I'll try to, to be brief. Um, thanks so for inviting me for this important conversation. Um, the presentation that I've, um, I've seen is very rich and informative. So in, there are some great insights from there. And it's great to be with um, uh, Omar and Miriam and hear their insights as well. So I think I noted a few things that I want to, to interact with, and then we can hear from people here in, to, for, for a deeper conversation. Um, in terms of um, the contradictions that we are seeing uh, in the case of Egypt in terms of investment in fossil fuel projects, and at the same time, investment in so-called renewable energies. This is not just unique to Egypt. This is a global tendency. Um, actually, in a report that we published at the Transnational Institute in 2020, we were wondering if we are currently seeing an energy transition or an energy expansion. And in reality, we are seeing an energy expansion. There is investment in renewable energy, but at the same time, there is expansion of fossil fuel projects. We are seeing um, more infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure being built, more ports, more pipelines, more exploration and extraction of, of fossil fuels, and going to the extremes, extraction of shale oil and gas and offshore and offshore drilling. So we are, I think this point needs to be always on the, at, at the table because there is global discussions around transition and, and, and so forth, but it's not really happening, especially after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Right now we are seeing a rush towards getting more gas to secure U Europe energy security. So this is what the first point that I want to make. The second point is, is around the COP process. And I think Miriam um, talked a, a bit about this. Um, but I want to, to emphasize a few points around this. For me, I think the COP process is a rigged game from the start. Um, for me, I, I don't believe in that process uh, for a long time. I gave up on it for a long time. I only was seeing it as an opportunity to organize, strategize with social movements, with grassroots groups, with trade unions, around questions of climate justice and just transition. So usually the COP process 
give space for civil society. So people organize some kind of people summit or counter summits or some independent autonomous spaces for civil society to organize and at least to, to come up with, with alternative and to pressure from the outside. As for the co-process, what it's called conferences of the parties, I think it's uh, more appropriate to call it the conference of the polluters, um, the fossil fuel industry, the mining industry, and th there are a lot of examples. Uh, the COP27 this year, you know, the official sponsor is Coca-Cola, you know, one of the biggest users of plastics in the world and one of the biggest users of water in the world. And then you look at the, I think, and you mentioned the level of lobbyists, of fossil fuel lobbyists, and this is not just you know, COP27, it happened in Glasgow, it happened in other conferences before, but I think we've, sh we've seen a sharp rise. And another anecdote, uh, I, I just follow a little bit of the discussions. So there is a draft, a draft for the final statement of the conference that is being, you know, discussed right now before being published either Friday or Saturday. So for a conference that talks about addressing the climate crisis, and we know what is the cause of climate crisis, is fossil capitalism, is the overuse of fossil fuels. There is no single mention of fossil fuels in that, in that statement. So that's why it is a rigged game. It, it's not just about the presence of, of polluters, it's also that companies, corporations um, have dominated the process and they and they are promoting what, what some people call false solutions they promote market based mechanisms um like trade and car uh, you know carbon trading offsets and some of of those things are you know packaged in a neutral or beautiful language like nature based solutions net zero all of these are an opportunity for the corporations to maintain their own profits to maintain their own operations so it's it's the same paradigm but just with a green with a green facade so this is um around the, the cop the cop process then the third point is around the hydrogen economy so I've done some work of this and I'm, I'm, I'm still following and doing more work on those projects that are taking place in the North African or the Arab region in general, because there is a kind of a hype around this. Personally, I still believe it is a hype. And most of those projects, I don't believe that they're gonna take place. Um, why? First of all, most of the production right now of hydrogen in the world is still, gray hydrogen, hydrogen from gas. That's why a lot of people and analysts are saying this is just a backdoor for the fossil fuel industry to continue its own operation. It's a second lease of life. They are, you look at the lobbies of green hydrogen in Europe, um, uh, the, the biggest lobby is called Hydrogen Europe. Um, the sponsors and the allies of that lobbies are, you know, fossil fuel industries, Total, Shell. Why, why are they supporting this? Because they know that in the short term, what is going to be produced is gray hydrogen directly from gas or blue hydrogen um, with what they call the carbon capture and sequestration technology, which is not reliable, as, um, as you rightly mentioned. So it is a way of maintaining those, those operations. And then at the same time, it is also um, an opportunity to create new frontiers for capital, to create new global value chains where the capitalist and imperialist divisions and hierarchies are maintained. So you look at who is pushing those projects all over the world, you find countries like Germany. Why is Germany doing this? First of all, they would like to uh, secure their own energy security, but at the same time, they want to export their own technologies and push their corporate sector to dominate that sector globally. Um, what annoys me about those projects, 
uh, because it's not about being against technology, or against science, or, or against green hydrogen per se. Green hydrogen would play a role, but not as it is being presented right now as a silver bullet or as a miraculous solution that would solve a lot of the, the, uh, our problems. And it's not Hamza who is saying this. There are a lot of scholars, engineers, scientists, activists who are saying, um, that green hydrogen would play a small role in the transition. And even some people questioning the premise that green hydrogen is really green and not polluting. There are a lot of scientific studies who are doing this. But what annoys me is those companies coming from outside, either from the West or from the Gulf or from India, coming to countries, let's say, Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco, pushing for those projects with an export priority and imperative. We need those countries to produce green hydrogen to be exported to Europe, so Europe uh, ensures its own energy security. That's why I think the category of colonialism or energy colonialism or neo-colonialism is important here. Some people call it green, green colonialism, um, colonialism with, with a green facade. But those projects have socio-environmental costs. They take huge surfaces of land. Like um, uh, we, we've documented the project in Southern Morocco by Total Iran, which is a subsidiary of Total, um, looking to build a big green hydrogen facility. And you, know, you look at the amount of land that is be used, you'll be shocked, 170,000 hectares. And I had to look to look at it, to look at the surface, to see how much is 170,000 hectares. It's more than the surface of Greater London, like just for those projects. And then they're gonna use the same, you know, colonial environmental narrative that those lands are empty, there are no populations there, and we need to come and create value by, by exploiting it. So um, I don't know if I still, I, I still have time, but you know, uh, when it comes to Egypt being, um, trying to be a hub for um, not just green energy, a hub for energy, a regional hub for energy, um, to export to Europe. But this, you know, comes, of course, at the expense of local populations. Of course, it's, it's a brutal military dictatorship. But then, um, and Miriam mentioned this, it comes also at the expense of Palestinians. You know, we are seeing that those projects and, and the fact that Egypt wants to be a hub is linked, you know, to normalization with the settler colonial state of Israel. And that, that, is what is, uh, that is what is happening. And then um, we look, uh, I think you mentioned in the presentation that the European Union went and signed the deal about gas as well with uh, Egypt and Israel. So we are seeing all those contradictions, investments in green energy, and at the same time, you are grabbing more gas. So it's, it's not really a contradiction. That's why it's more appropriate to talk about energy expansion. But then I think I'll, I'll, finish, I'll finish by this in terms of um, what is the solution and what are we arguing for? I think one of the tenets and premises of climate justice is the recognition of the differential responsibilities in causing climate crisis. And that responsibility historically lies with the industrial West, the industrialized West, and of course, there are growing powers, emerging powers who share some of that responsibilities like China and India. But, and then recognizing also the various or the differential vulnerability and capabilities to addressing the climate crisis. That, that's why in here we need to put the question of climate reparations and climate debts at the center of our discussions. And I think um, it is an ongoing discussion because it, it's not a straightforward question. How are you gonna you know, channel the money to military dictatorships and corrupt regimes? And I don't have the answer. So I, I really don't have the answer, but I think as progressive forces, we need to seriously think about how that money is channeled. And by the way, the Egyptian government or the Egyptian regime is not talking about climate reparations. It's talking about climate finance, and that's different. Climate finance is additional debt, is additional loan. 
the, the Egyptian military right now, because of the uh, huge amount of debts that they accumulated, they need money. And wherever that money comes from, they welcome it. And that's why we are seeing the COP27 as an opportunity to capture some of that foreign direct investment, to capture some of that, that climate finance. But I think what we should be arguing is climate reparation, which is transfer of wealth and technology from the rich countries to the impoverished countries. And I think uh, going into the mechanism of how to do that is 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 a different is a different conversation in terms of the uh, in terms of the military i think um, you are right uh, to mention that the military is hiding its own emissions is escaping from that discussion uh, actually the transnational institute is working a lot on questions of militarism and climate justice and the, we published um, a report just yesterday showing that you know uh, between 2013 and 2021, $9.45 trillion has been spent on the military globally compared to only $244 billion on climate. And the richest nations, which is the Annex 2 of the core process, are spending 30 times more than what they spend on, on the climate. So just a tiny, tiny amount of that money could be used, you know, to help countries adapt to the impacts of climate crisis, as well as help them in their own energy transition. And I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Hamza, for, for that piercing intervention. Thanks. We have a, a, a comment and a question, actually, from, from the public. Uh, remember, you can send your questions. I'm not mentioning the name. And uh, the comment is, Miriam is absolutely right. COP is used to normalize, as are all of these meetings, including those in the Gulf and Egypt, and eventually ends up being used by the media. It also advances a narrative of normalization and of inclusion, and strengthens the approach that the Palestinians can be ignored and sidelined with no consequence. And at the end of the day, all these are eventually parts of arms deals cyber. Um, probably um, we have to interpret that in, in, in some way or another, but uh, then the question goes, but is online resistance effective when these platforms favor state actors? Suppose that's 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 for you, Miriam. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, do you want to collect the questions or just go one after the other? Just let me know. Which just one. this one uh, first, yeah. and then we'll probably go back to to one that you you raised for for Anne and, and Mohammed. We have around ten minutes more, um, and then we'll wrap up. But uh, yeah, probably. We're going to go with uh, with those yeah. two questions. And wrap up. I mean, yeah. that's a good question because I mean, for all for those of us who work also on Arab uprisings, and obviously any discussion about uh, COP now in, in in Egypt. I mean, I just cannot forget the fact that uh, you know the tragic the tragedy that is deliberate um, and the craziness of having to receive news about someone who didn't die. And, and wrote a note to his parents saying he's still alive. I mean, the fate of Alap al Fattah. It is so related to the question because uh, the use of online uh, tools and online activism, it is part and parcel of the narrative about the Arab uprisings. This is what uh, Alap al Fattah and his comrades and friends were part of, the Egyptian uprising in 2011. And so, I think in my field in media and communication studies, there was this huge leap in research and scholarship around the question of online tools for activism and for, and for, and for political organizing. And so it's actually really, really directly related. And I mean, of course, on the one hand, there's been this critique, and I think it's important to remember, a lot of the research and reporting was because there was this kind of strange orientalist surprise, like, huh? these people are using, uh, the internet and of course no idea that there was this whole world of Arab techies. There were Arab techie meetings in Cairo, in in in, in Beirut, um, and so there's a huge uh, story to re to remember uh, when we talk about online activism uh, that actually uh, teaches us a very important lesson, namely of the limitations of the of the um, the successes of online activism. Uh, 
people who are in prison now, they were online activists uh, in the sense that they were programmers, uh, they were bloggers, uh, they were doing all kinds of important analysis. Uh, and a lot of them have been um, killed, are in exile or are in prison. Uh, 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 Hussam Hamalawi, I think, is in exile. Allah is in prison. Uh, very, uh, um, very, very uh, smart, interesting. Arab Taki in Syria, Basil Khatabil was killed by the Syrian regime. This is the reality of online activism and people who use technology for political struggles. And I think my answer would be yes, it is, because it's part of the natural uh, ecology we, we have around us. It would be strange to say also when printing or writing uh, facilities were made easier. Do you use a pen and pencil? Of course, we use technologies because they're part of our natural environment, but at the same time, it doesn't have a deterministic uh, um, uh, 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 power. And precisely because the regional politics we're talking about, we're talking about the intersection of imperialism and capitalism. And those two mean that the financial uh, um, uh, visions in uh, the uh, policies of the internet companies that we're talking about when we're talking about these tools, these tools we're talking about are part of corporations. They have particular objectives and aims, and sometimes they coincide with the activists very briefly, but a lot of times they don't, and they are willing to make compromises with regimes. They're willing to monitor for regimes. They're willing to surveil. They're willing to uh, 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 censor uh, activists when those imperial or, or a political economic interests coincide. So I think that's what I wanted to uh, answer. Uh, of course, people have to use technologies because it's like you use a pen and a paper in, in a sense. But of course, not rely uh, on that without understanding the dynamics of grassroots organizing. That's what really scares the these regimes. Yeah, Miriam, um, uh, we, we would like to, to, to reformulate um, your comment to, to, to Anne and Mohammed. Actually, it was a question probably on your second point, so that they can respond. I think it was about your presentation, um, their presentation, sorry, the question about the presentation. Yeah, I mean, I was just, my question was to them also about the political dynamics. I mean, the, um, the contradiction, Hamza mentioned it, hosting this in a place where there's this extreme authoritarian reality is it a way to like divert attention to gaslight but does it work like do you think that having all the press and the world talking about this and the tweets and stuff will this undermine the sort of public diplomacy attempts of of the egyptian government um did the activists actually make progress by using this momentum and grab it and 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 focus on uh, cases like Al Abdul Fattah, uh, or is this too optimistic? Ah, uh, Noor Mohammed. Um, well, actually, I mean, I guess also we should ask um, Omar as well for his thoughts on this question because, I mean, I think in some ways there has been the degree of attention that has been paid to uh, Alaa's case as I know, at least anecdotally, from talk, talking to people who don't normally follow news about Egypt, that they have heard of his name. They, you know, people in my in my trade union branch, or people, even people, you know, I've met and talked to in the office who don't work on Egypt. They know they, they know his name now. Um, so, it, in a sense, that is something positive that's come out of it, despite the um, you know, just despite the horrific circumstances. On the other hand, though, I, I, I think that actually there is the, the there's certainly been calls from Egypt as well for uh, uh, grassroots climate justice organizations to not go to the COP and not to participate in order to avoid this kind of um, legitimation of the uh, of the regime. And, and I think I think that the it's quite finely balanced. Um, and that really, from my experience of having studied social movements in Egypt for, for many years, that things that will shift the, the situation um, are not to be found really around the COP. It's to do with the strength of the, of the mobilizations at the grassroots level around questions such as 
you know, everyday questions about whether people can afford to get on the metro and for you know, or or, or the bus, um, or whether they whether they can build up enough confidence to be able to go into the streets to take strike action or to organize themselves. Because those kinds of grassroots and molecular movements um, that grew up in many years before 2011 were the ones that paved the way for the opening of political space um, between with the with the uprising and the revolution beginning in, 20, in 2011 and then for a few years a more open um, a more open space for politics which was all done from organization from below it was not the gift of people at the top of society they were forced to open um, and that any steps forward that were made temporarily in the sense of creating space for, for, for greater dissent and criticism were done because of the strength of those, those social movements, I would say. And that would be the same for the future, I think, in Egypt too. Yeah. Omar, would you like to pick up on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's too early to tell what the long-term effects of this will be, but I think, um, it was interesting the point that Miriam you were making about how the fact that it was like a UN zone allowed them to invite the Israelis and that was a point of normalization which obviously has been developed massively since then and it's sort of the inverse has sort of happened in Egypt right where like you know we normalized 40 years ago and on every level like the regime has sort of supplicated and made every kind of like deal it could possibly make with the outside world and so the fact that it being the UN zone, actually, you know, there was a protest inside it. And that was the first time there was ever a protest inside the UNFCCC zone because they couldn't do it outside. And um, but at the same time, on Friday the 11th, there had been these sort of calls for a protest to happen in the street. And, you know, every once in a while that happens and you never really know if this is just something that's going on on Facebook or something that might actually spark something in real life. And and. 90% of the time you, you you believe it's just going to be something that's going around on Facebook, but it always spooks the regime and, um, you know, they, they completely shut down the country, huge mobilization of police, they actually cancelled public transport everywhere on that Friday, they, um, they ordered every educational building in the country closed, they put out fake news saying that extreme weather was going to be coming. Um, so they got they always get very nervous about these kinds of things, that, but nobody, nobody, there was no moment of spark and nobody went out. Um, and had there been like a, an organized underground or organized opposition, um, you know, that would have been the perfect opportunity to try something. But of course, they have completely dismembered the opposition so that there is no organizational structure that can that can actually try and take a risk like that. Um, so instead, yeah, there was this protest that happened inside the zone. And I, and I do think that what has happened you know has been pretty historic and i think it will definitely have rattled them um and i think just the fact of being able to like have a press conference or that conf that 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 event where hossein Bakat and senat spoke kind of with the head of amnesty and human rights watch and you know and they had a really good frank open discussion in egypt about egypt and that's something that we haven't been able to do there for 10 years so or nine years or whatever um so it's too early to know but it definitely feels like it's been significant and hopefully it can have ripple effects beyond this and into the future. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Uh, Omar um, by the way, I think it's going to be very important uh, also to ask if you can give us any updates uh, about Alice's situation. Um, so I, I would like yeah. to, to kind of take that sort of opportunity now. I know that the visit, the Monday visit is, is taking place tomorrow. Um, so if there are not, yeah. not, not updates, maybe just also kind of, and make the case for you know supporting uh, uh you know the message that that, that he mm. should be recognized as a british it's british citizen and that he should be released from prison but well yeah please yeah well we don't know i mean what we know is that he started a water strike on the first day of cop and that really drove the story and that became this huge issue and, and i think it was really um you know i'm someone that i'm his cousin i've been working on free outlet campaigns for sort of, you know, 10 years. Um, and I think it was an amazing move from him where he was really driving the issue with his decision there. And suddenly he was like driving the whole question of what was going on at COP and everyone kind of fell in behind him. And then, yeah, we got a note out on Monday saying that on Saturday he had started drinking water again. And then a note came out on Tuesday saying, I've broken my strike um, and that I will tell you more on Thursday. So that's tomorrow. We have no idea what 
more has happened inside. We, we really don't know anything other than the two notes that came out and that the family published, you know, photographs of. Um, so there is no information that, that the family has that is not in the public domain. Um, and so we'll find out tomorrow. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot of work has gone into Alec's case, and a lot of people around the world have been working on him and supporting him and thinking about how to to mobilize political pressure however they can around the world. And I think the reason is because people feel like he's a bottleneck case, right? Like the feeling is, is that because the regime has just chosen to punish this one person in this symbolic way, where they've just made it clear that he's never going to get out of prison and that he is the symbol of the, the of the revolutionary youth and that he is going to die in prison. And that's what everybody in Egypt understands, right? And so that's why I think so much focus and so much energy has poured into the campaign for him from around the world, because the feeling is, is that, you know, if you can get him out, then all kinds of things could follow afterwards. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the major tug of war happening. Um, and uh yeah i don't know so we're going to see what happens tomorrow yeah thank you Omar, for, for, for that update and yeah. important to, to to remember that i, I think I, I have one last question to to, to wrap up i think it's, it's it's going to be a kind of a, a good final question in fact so the question is without being falsely utopian about activists this is from the public right without being falsely utopian about activist media sorry can you see a way to use digital media better and which clear understanding of what it can do in the future? Probably the central question here, and this is just the own words of the, the, the person who's asking, are data projects like this, the reactor, the data lab, useful? In what way, I would add as well. Right, I don't know if anyone, even even people from, from, from the, the data lab, people who worked in the data lab, is this, is this something that you would like to, to pick up on? Shall I have a go at this? Yeah, you want? Um, is it useful? Well, I mean, like Omar said, perhaps it's too soon to say. Um, we were very uh, aware that we made a very a small contribution to uh, a discussion and a, and a debate, and anything that we publish out of this will be a drop in the ocean compared to um, the scale of the challenge and also compared to the, the information, the data that's, um, that's out there. Um, but I think that if we are in institutions like the University of Cambridge, which is a large, rich, old institution that has its own, um, you know, heritage of a complicity and being enmeshed in, in all sorts of uh, legacies of colonialism and enslavement and so on, um, that we also actually have a positive duty to try and open up those spaces to be places where ideas can be debated, where the tools and skills that um, you know, that, that, that we teach and the things that we learn can be shared with wider, with wider audiences. And that was the, the, that was the, purpose, the, the part of the purpose of doing this. I, I, I don't believe that that in itself changes the world, um, and, but it's a, it, it can be a space in which we can, we can exchange ideas and learn, and learn things from each other. So I think if we've started to do that, that is a, is a good step. And that, as I said at the beginning, the data lab as a format is as an idea of uh, an incubator of lines of inquiry, of conversations and of collaborations. And I think we'll be taking those on and, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll be looking towards outlets for developing those further, um, uh, both hopefully with, uh, with the panelists and the participants in the lab. So um, we look forward to developing that over the next, uh, over the next few months. Yeah, thank you. And on that note, I think um, we'll have to, to, to conclude this, uh, this public session uh, of this reactor and the, data, the presentation of uh, the results from the data lab, just by saying, well, first, thank you all for attending, right? Secondly, also, please stay tuned because uh, you know that the results, the outcomes from the data lab are going to be available um, if you write to us to learning at cdh.cam.ac.uk. Uh, the, the presentation is going to be available, uh, the interactive map of fossil fuel exploration activity, um, the data set that can be used uh, widely for other projects as well on energy infrastructure transformation, and also the visualization um, on uh, fuel lobbyists at COP27 
is going to be available. And just secondly, kind of as an announcement, as an announcement from CDH, um, we run a data school, the social data school. Applications are open for the social data school for one week in January from the 9th to the 13th. If you want to know more, please go to the to the website and uh, read the program and uh, the teaching um, staff that is going to be there. So, well, thank you very much for everyone. I think we'll uh, finish here, but um, yeah, we'll definitely stay, stay in touch uh, via our social media accounts and please do write to us to, to our email. So thank you everyone.